see in that list the foo block. I know that that module is generating, generating that, that code, that block. So maybe, you know, if, if the instructions or the descriptions say, you know, creates a block that shows relative related uh, nodes or something like that, and you're not sure what block it is, you know, you can find the block info, find the text, and then figure out what you need to put on your page there. Um, hook theme. Uh, the good thing about hook, or the, probably the easiest thing about hook theme is that's when a module defines when I'm doing an output and I want to uh, theme it. Uh, how do I do that? The, for this level of stuff, looking at the stuff, it can call code to do that, which is probably beyond this level of stuff. Or you can, uh, or you can uh, call, you can look, a lot of times they'll call a TPL file. So in that, inside that function, if you see something that says foo.tpl or template equals, actually it'll see, it'll probably say template equals, you know, uh, foo item or something like that. You can then say, ah, somewhere in this module might be a template file that I could pull into my form. Usually template files are just snippets of HTML. So as a themer, you could pull that into your your theme if you wanted to change the layout of the item that the module does. So that's, that's the nice thing about hook theme. Um, hook permission, that basically does what you think it does. It defines all of the permissions that the module creates. Uh, it's kind of nice just to look at, but uh, it's also just as easy to look at it in the permission screen because the permissions will say foo module and then list the permissions there. Uh, I guess one thing that might be nice is sometimes people um, people put in comments in the in the code so there there might be some extra information about a permission in the code there. Uh, a more complex one and it's just an indicator to, to show that there might be something there is if somebody has implemented a hook views API that basically means, oh, this module is supplying me with some stock views. Sort of like, uh, I don't know if anybody's ever used like the admin views module that updates core so that you can search for usernames and search, search for by title on the content. If you haven't, I, it's a, one of the nice things to, to throw in there. That's an example of a module that's supplying views uh, built into it. So. So anyway, how do you find, you know, so now you know what a hook is, kind of what to look for, where do you find the files to look in? And that's where understanding a little bit about the module directory is, is good. You know, um, you know, their modules generally have an English name, the names you see on the uh, module list, and then they'll have what Drupal is becoming uh, the, the terminology in Drupal now is machine name. Everything is getting a machine name, which is usually lowercase letters and underscores. Um, so the base name and the directory name for a module is usually when you go to download it from drupal.org, you'll see project slash and then a, a name on the URL. That's actually the machine name. Another, another little trick and another kind of module tip is uh, um, there's a there's a module called uh, module filter uh, that's nice because if you have a lot of modules on your site it actually lets you uh, slice and dice instead of one big list that you have to scroll down you can search through them uh, the other thing that it does nice is it actually shows you the machine name on that screen so you just go to your mod you know so if you're trying to say where do I find wherever OG is installed or wherever uh, better messages is installed or something like that. You can just go there and find the, uh, the module name in there. Uh, I think it's module underscore filter. I may have it backwards, filter underscore module, but it's one of those two. One thing to notice, one thing to note is that um, 
modules can actually exist as subdirectories of other modules. Um, so for instance, like the OG, I keep using OG as an example, OG will have a whole bunch of sub-modules like OG views, uh, OG group access, and so there'll be a main module of OG, module directory of OG, and then underneath it will be things like OG views and so forth in there. So once you find that, uh, once you find that module directory, what are you, what are you gonna kind of see inside the module directory? The minimum you'll probably see is the base name, like og.info, or better underscore messages.info. Uh, and that basically is the file when you're looking for modules. That's what it's looking for, is these info files. Then there's also uh, you know, a dot module file, which is the core code that's gonna be loaded. 90% of the time, the core modules that you're looking for, like the help and menu and stuff like that, will be in like og.module. Uh, there are some cases where people throw them in include files, but uh, generally core modules need to be loaded during bootstrap, so, and the .module file is always loaded. So, too much technical information, but. I have question. Sure. Um, do you want me to wait for you? Oh, no, feel free. Uh, Yeah. Okay. I'm. I'm actually. I'll actually. You know, yeah. I don't know if the question gets picked up, but the question was about the uh, where where the actual base directory lives, and that's the next topic coming up. No, it's good. You're thinking ahead. Bonus points. <laughs> um, the recommended files will generally be a README and a license, and there might may or may not be an install file. And then there'll probably be a whole bunch of other files depending on the complexity of the module there. So this is an example of what the OG directory looks like. So you can see it on the left-hand side, which has got the directory tree. I started with OG. Uh, you'll see things that make sense like an image directory, includes directory, a modules directory. Uh, things like OG underscore accent, OG underscore access, um, OG underscore notifications. The one that look things that look like that are probably sub are definitely sub modules underneath that. And you'll see on the file list on the right uh, down at the bottom they have an OG dot info, an OG dot install, an OG dot modules, and a README. And I think I cut off the, the license is actually there, but and then some other files. So that's kind of what you're looking for on the file system. Now, how do you find it? <laughs> Thanks for being my straight man, straight, straight woman, <laughs> straight person. I'm not sure what the right politically correct term is now. Straight person, it used to be straight man. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it's, it's early in the morning and I've had a lot of coffee. And <laughs> so finding modules, well, there's, Two ways you can think of finding modules here. Um, how, what, you know, I'm looking at my site and what is doing this magic? You know, what is making this form? What is adding this to my form? What is adding this to my uh, node form in there? Unfortunately, that's beyond the scope of this talk, but that's more of an art than a science. Um, some of the tricks that I tend to use is to go into Firebug and look for identifying classes that may have module names embedded in them. So, you know, like if you go to uh, the node create form and you want to see what, where workbench forms are coming from or where, I um, can't think of a good, uh, the background image form, the little background image tab is coming from. You know, you can go to that tab, right click on it and, um, you know, hopefully there'll be something, a string or something like that that will identify, oh, this is coming from the, this module here. Or you can find a string that looks kind of unique and then have a good, uh, and most good editors will let you search a whole file system. So I tend to use, I tend to use Eclipse for, for me, it's, that's real easy. I just go to the modules directory or the, the site directory and I say search 
and type in my string and it goes through all the files and it gives me a nice little list. But uh, like I said, that's a little bit of an art, but it's doable. If you know, but if you're starting off with a human name, you know, I've already talked about how you take the human name and turn it into the base name in there. Uh, once you see that, you know, a, an easy way to do it is to say, okay, I don't want to go and start messing around with an editor on my real site, but I do want to understand what the Foo module does. Best thing to do, just go to drupal.org or wherever you downloaded the module, download it to a temporary directory and start splunking, start looking at the code there. Modules live a lot of different places. Uh, the three standard ones that you usually find are under your Drupal root, there's that infamous modules directory where everybody tries to install modules. Don't. That's core only modules. Um, there is a sites all modules. That's, a, that's the most common place for modules to go. Uh, sites all will be um, used by all. If you're, Most people probably don't have multi-site instances, but anything in sites all modules will be available if you're running multiple sites from the same Drupal instance in there. Um, the, sec the third most common is you can have specific site-specific modules under either site's default modules, or in some cases, if you're running a, a, a multi-site setup, you'll actually, under sites, you'll have something like site slash www.foo.com, site slash www.myfoo.com, and those are separate sites. They can have their own individual modules, so things that are custom to that. Um, a thing that didn't fit on the slide when I was updating them last night, uh, but came up in last presentation I did, is if you're dealing with a distribution, like Open Scholar or uh, one of those sorts of things, they actually hide a lot of the modules in the profiles directory. So at the root, Drupal root, there is a profiles directory. And then underneath the profiles directory will be kind of the list of profiles. For, for a stock Drupal install, it's just, I think it just says Drupal or core or standard. But for like Open Scholar, I think there's an Open Scholar directory for, uh, I can't think of another good, distribution. I think actually if you download stuff from Drupal Gardens, I think that's where they also put some of their modules too, are in the profile there. Uh, another thing and kind of another hint for setting up sites, with D7, with prior to D7, modules, the module directory was just kind of a big module directory. Everybody just kind of stuck their modules directly in the modules. Uh, the standard has modified for D7, and I think they've actually kind of tweaked it a little bit and maybe actually making it totally standard for D8 to do things like there usually will be a, there'll definitely usually be a contrib, contrib directory to indicate contributed. Um, sites, the, the standard I've adopted that a lot of other people use are um, to also create like a custom directory so you can put any custom modules there. Uh, a features directory, so if you're using features, you know those are the feature modules. And then, uh, I haven't really seen it in a lot of standards, but I like to do this is, a lot of times, the good, the good thing about open source, as I said, is if there's a problem, people solve it. But then they go away and say, my problem solved, so I'm gonna kinda do minimum maintenance. But in the issues, people come and say, hey, I found this, if you're using this module and this module, this module doesn't work quite right, here's a patch. And a lot of times those patches will be marked as approved by the community, so they, they seem fairly safe. So in that case, I'll create a patched directory. Copy, copy the module from contrib to that. And like I said, this is not, this is not a, a hard standard, but it's a good standard, I think it's a good standard. And then under that module, I'll create a patches directory download the patch there, patch the module right there. The nice thing about that is when you're going through and updating your modules, if you see something that lives in the patch directory, you know, I gotta look closely at this because the, next, the new version that's out may or may not include the patch that I had to apply to fix the problem that I found when I was doing the site. So, not really germane to this talk, but 
just good Drupal practices. So, you know, so basically you go into these directories and you search for the base directory. Or once again, if you've got a good, uh, if, you, if you know, uh, if you're a, like if you're Linux and your Linux foo is, is good, you can always do a find and search for the, you know, like go into CD into your Drupal group and do a, a find hyphen name, base name, dash print. And then that will search through all of your Drupal files and find you that directory. So, but I figured, I figured for this audience that would not necessarily be a, a, a strength. So. so we talked about the info file here. Um, it's pretty plain. Uh, the one thing that's interesting with D7 is that uh, if there are any objects or uh, views and stuff like that, you will usually find them where it says files in there. So this is, I think, my favorite was OG. So you can see a lot of the OG stuff, and those are actually uh, objects and stuff like that. But you know, it's also a good way to check that you're you're looking at the right directory because it'll have uh, a version number and the English name and description there. So, uh, oh yeah, I should also point out that uh, if a module is adding CSS to your uh, to your site, this is also where the CSS will be listed as well. So. Okay, what's what's in the uh, module file? So foo.module. Uh, a bunch of stuff, and but generally you'll start seeing things like the uh, function Dixie coaching underscore help. Use some of my ancient ancient code here, uh, which indicates that okay, that's the module. So uh, how do you find that? You know, search and find in your editor. So you take that module file, you load it up, you say, okay, I want to find out what menu items this module supplies. Search for underscore menu. So go back to that list of modules, underscore help, underscore menu, underscore block info, underscore theme, and that will kind of start giving you an idea of what this module uh, will do for you and what special hidden URLs might be there. So what, what do the specific modules look like here? Hook help, you can see node gallery underscore help here. Uh, and if you look at the, I'll switch over here where I can point. So, you know, you can see things like to configure what displayed in here, to edit, and you can, so that's all kind of the readable part of hook help. It's formatted nicely in the help, but sometimes, um, sometimes for various reasons, they have subpages that don't show up in the help. Um, or uh, uh, one of my favorites is, I should have said there is an, there is a uh, ad advanced help hook that uh, Merlin of Chaos, the guy that wrote views and C tools and CCK and uh, a bunch of other very, very useful things, d didn't like the help system, so he wrote his own help system. So sometimes for his code, it's actually easier to go and look at his underscore advanced help than it is to try to walk through the code there. So how, what does hook menu look like? Generally, you'll have something like a list of these items with a bunch of stuff here. The things that are kind of interesting here is, I don't know if you can see it or not, but right into items is OG slash subscribe slash dollar sign note. Well, that, that's kind of interesting because that means you can go to, that's a URL you can go to, OG slash subscribe, and then if you put a note ID there, something will come up. In there. The one thing to be careful about is some of these are callbacks to forms, so it may come back and, and uh, white screen or do other things. So, um, but as if you get down, I don't think I did it, but if you scan down, sometimes you can also see that uh, they should be a, generally is a title here. And I don't think I grabbed one, but yeah, title, like leave group. So if you're trying to figure out what the action is for that, if it has a title there, that usually means it's going to generate a page. Um, and also that means that the tab, so if you see a link and the title is leave group and the URL looks like OG unsubscribe, a node, a node number and a user number, 
that's, that's the way those two get tied together there. But, you know, is that clear question? Like I say, the, the nice thing about that is it does give you a chance at finding admin screens. Usually the admin stuff starts with a slash with admin in there. Hook block info. The block info is fairly straightforward. Uh, for instance, the, mac the masquerade uh, module has a block called masquerade. So um, the info here, this is the info is basically what it's going to show up in the block list. So if you're looking to see what blocks a module produces, you can kind of just go through and, and look at the info titles. And that's what, those are the English names that will show up in the, in the structure blocks area. And actually, if you wanted to uh, have a chance at understanding it, sort of an advanced topic is there is a hook that's block view, and it passes in what's called the delta. The delta is actually this little tag, so you'll see something like case masquerade, um, and this will be some pointer to the node, the actual code. Probably that's for any, any budding, any budding uh, programmers, not for your standard admins here. Hook theme. Hook theme. Uh, is fairly simple, but in some cases it can be complicated. Uh, I tend to look for things that say uh, template here. So if it says template coaching terms, that means that there's actually going to be a coaching hyphen terms dot tpl dot php file in the module. And you could take that, copy it to your theme, and change the HTML if you wanted to change the output what the output looks like. Uh, sometimes the stuff are actually code, and they're, um, there are ways to override code, but that's, that's for another talk sometime. You'll see title, description, and like I say, all that stuff, that shows up in permission. That's just sort of a cover it all, but uh, if you want to go to the permissions screen, you'll basically see the same information here displayed much nicer. Uh, last one is hook views API. As I said, it gets to be uh, more complicated, but uh, the big thing is that if you see something like this in uh, your code, that means there are going to be some views out there. Um, and if you see something like this, views to include, you could actually go and look in that directory. And you know, you can actually, if you if you look at some of the include files. Uh, it'll be a bunch of settings in there, but you could probably, you usually can figure out that the view name, the name that the view is, comes up fairly close to the top. So it's sort of like a, another little advanced topic, but it's kind of nice for figuring out what views a module supplies. And of course, there's a whole bunch, as I mentioned earlier, hundreds of hooks, but some kind of interesting ones, common ones are, there's a whole set of hook underscore node underscore insert, save, pre-save, uh, view, uh, things like that. Uh, there's a whole set of hook underscore user underscore that deal with like user view, user insert, user login, um, that sort of thing. Um, hook form alter, where um, this basically is what modules use to add things to forms. I didn't cover that specifically here, but if you're looking for where forms are getting changed, look for hook form alter. Uh, hook schema, if you want to know what database tables, look in the dot install file that I mentioned, and there will be something that says something underscore schema, and you'll actually see some code representation of the tables there. Uh, hook cron, so if you're looking to see what cron jobs this module requires, they will have implemented hook cron. Uh, and a tricky one that is not used as much, um, but still is used sometimes, is hook underscore form name underscore alter. And finding a form name and figuring that out is a little bit more complicated, I think, than we want to, uh, uh, to cover here. And actually, it can't surprise me, I'm actually on time here. So if I confuse you guys all, if you're looking for 
you know, more questions, more info around development stuff. Uh, the book that got me started many, many years ago, I guess it's been five or more years ago, was Drupal Pro Development. Um, as I mentioned, the Drupal API site is kind of the Bible when it comes to, to APIs. Um, they continue to they continue to improve that. One of the standards for Drupal now is that it should be self-documenting wherever possible. Um, there's also Drupal, things like DrupalContrib.org, which have a lot of information on uh, hooks and API stuff for non-core modules. And of course, you know, just Drupal.org and Googling and looking for um, you know, now that you kind of, if you understand the nomenclature, it's a lot easier to say, I want, I want to implement hook menu. Instead of, I want to add something to a menu. If you say, I want to, impl I want to do this using un hook underscore menu, you're more likely to find something that has a little code snippet that you can plug into your uh, thing. That's one thing I think I skipped over real fast was, hooks don't have to live in modules. Hooks can actually live in your template.php, so if you're a themer, uh, a lot of times you'll see snippets of code where they say add uh, your theme name underscore links is a common one to be able to do something special to, to the links display. So what you're actually doing is in a template you're, you're implementing hook underscore links in there. So. Well, any questions? Yes. A question is, is there a best practice for adding JavaScript to modules? Uh, I think with D7, the recommended thing is if you have a module to put it in the info file. Um, you know, and, and you can do the same thing with themes. So the themes, the themes have an info file just like a module. Uh, where That's where you can, you know, it's like if you read the instructions for subsetting something like Bootstrap, you know, it'll say copy the theme, the, the info file uh, and if add add a files bracket CSS equals local or files bracket quote JS quote in there. Um, that's still no guarantee that you know if you're if two people are trying to add uh, the same jQuery stuff or trying to deal with the same tags, you know you, you you're gonna. Uh, yeah, that actually gets into editor wars, but my, my personal, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> it's, a lot of it depends on your background. I actually started out programming in Java, so I was very familiar with Eclipse, and I moved over to the Eclipse PHP. Uh, it's got some things that, some terminology and some stuff that's kind of Java specific, but I find that it's, it's pretty good. I know a lot of people swear by the Aptana, which is uh, Zend. Uh, in there, uh, you know, and usually if you're getting into developing code, you will probably want an ID. It's not going to be. I usually say if I'm doing something quick, I'm going to use something like Genie or Notepad or something that I can just open the file. But if I'm doing code development where I'm dealing with a lot of different files, I'll go into an IDE that lets me see the whole thing. Um, you know, I guess some some pros, some nice things about. Uh, Eclipse that other things do is things like uh, it knows all about core stuff so you, it will do type ahead so if you start entering core modules it'll give you suggestions on what the naming is if you hover over uh, a module that it has the source code for and has Java kind of the PHP docs which are like Java docs it'll show you the little help so it you know it has a lot of help stuff. Did you mention PHP store? Uh, yeah, like I said, I was getting into. I knew this was editor wars. I'm just, I'm, I'm doing it from the Eclipse stuff. But yeah, PHP Storm, I think, is another. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's like I say. That's what I said when I started this. It's, it's, it's editor wars. I, I, I started off in Java, so. Uh, Uh, 
Um, I will generally have a copy of the website locally here. So uh, I actually feel kind of guilty because I'm running my Windows thing for the first time in four months, I think, just because it's easier to sync up uh, external things. But I run Linux for my development box, so I've got Apache, PHP, all of that stuff in there. Um, nice thing about most editors is you can actually kind of uh, point them to the in-place code. You know, so it's basically in your uh, web apps directory. Um, I tend to, Drupal can also survive with having, you know, the doc root, and then even though on the main server it is in the doc root, usually you can make a subdirectory. In fact, I usually, I usually have a, uh, what, I, what I tend to do is I will make, I have a git, git directory, I will clone, uh, using git, I will clone the development slash production site onto my local box. And then since I'm using Linux, I'll do a symlink from the web to, you know, so like foo, foo site goes to git slash foo or home directory git slash foo in there. And then my editor will be set up that the foo project will point to the foo directory there. So then you can make changes and then go to your browser and do localhost slash foo and, you know, and once you're happy, once you're happy, then usually we upload it to a, uh, dev slash staging server so the client can review it and then once they uh, review it then we push it out to production. So, any other questions? Oh. Well, thank you. Hopefully, hopefully you learned something. <laughs> so.